the South, the morning news brief in Telesur English. We begin this new edition right now. We begin in Argentina, where after 12 hours of debate, accompanied by dramatic scenes of protest and repression, Argentina's Congress has approved President Macri's bitterly disputed pension reform. The decision by 127 votes to 117 came at dawn as protests outside the Congress continued through the night. The reform will change the way pensions are adjusted, and the protesters say the elderly will suffer. The government says the change is needed to cover its fiscal deficit. They say they don't know where to find the money. They can't find the money. They can get the money from their taxes. The money can come from gambling. The money can come from so many places. They can get the money from the mining companies. But no, they take it from me, a humble retiree. From me and so many other retirees, many of whom don't have the strength to walk out here. How many more years I will be able to walk? To be able to walk, how many more years? Throughout Monday, there were demonstrations and violent repression as the debate unfolded in Congress. Protesters threw rocks and firecrackers at police near the Congress building. The police responded with tear gas and water cannon to suppress the crowds. We have more in this report. Despite threats, workers gathered throughout Monday on the streets outside the Argentine Congress, protesting against the new pension reform that would jeopardize thousands of retirees just days before the Christmas and New Year holidays. It's a shame what the president is doing, giving his own people a miserable Christmas, which is not right. Without a decent meal, without bread, and a new year without hope, this is not the moment to do what he's doing. Huge crowds filled the center of Buenos Aires. They were demanding that those who make least money should not be affected despite the fact the police were banned from using weapons. We are against these measures and the repression because this is a right-wing government working for the Yankees. With this large mobilization by workers, we believe this battle can be won. Strong images were seen of policemen arriving to block the protest and threatening to attack something many hadn't seen since the time of Argentina's military dictatorship. The government is rejected by the people, even by its own supporters, who saw the state repression, evidence that it's an unpopular law, where the majority of the population is against it. As the repression intensified, there were reports of police firing tear gas inside the city's subway system, affecting passerby and commuters. All this while the Congress was debating the law, generating indignation and anger. The retirees are mobilized. We don't know if we are going to win this fight. But even if we lose it, they are stealing from us. They are lackeys of the empire who want to take us to a state of colonialism. These pictures from a balcony show the police using tear gas in the narrow streets against a crowd with no escape. Workers' unions say they will continue to resist in the streets with a strong plan of strikes and mobilizations. They say this law deepens the economic and social model of a neoliberal government. Senators have denounced the methods used by the police against the demonstrators and members of Congress who are supporting the protests. They say police have violated human rights, even to the extent of using torture. In this picture, we can see Argentinian police holding Congresswoman Mayra Mendoza and spraying pepper spray into her mouth. And in another video posted on Twitter, the police are seen spraying a pensioner several times with pepper spray and then hitting him with a truncheon. Just moments ago, Argentina's president, Mauricio Macri, gave a news conference where he defended and thanked the police for their actions during the protest. He said he was sure the violence was planned by opposition groups. 
What I want to tell you is that all that violence we saw was clearly orchestrated. We will face it with justice to understand who was responsible, because it wasn't spontaneous. In Argentina, we live in a climate of peace. There is hope for the future. Brazil's Congress was also due to vote this Tuesday on President Michel Temer's pension reform, which has been bitterly disputed. But after months of protests, trade unions and social movements were able to force a delay in the vote. On Monday, the Speaker of Brazil's lower house announced that lawmakers would restart the debate on February the 5th, before a vote two weeks later. The pension reform has been a central plank of Temer's neoliberal adjustments. Two days after the Electoral Court declared him the winner of last month's election, the Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernández has addressed the nation to thank the people for re-electing him. He said he would not let them down. We'll bring peace, understanding and progress. As a civilian and as elected president of Honduras, I humbly accept the people's will. I think it's not time for triumphalism or celebration, but the time to thank you from the bottom of my soul, to every voter that trusted me, that supported me with conviction. I know you have made sacrifices and have risked your life to defend democracy and your right to choose. I am committed to not breaking your trust and honor your hope with work. For his part, the opposition candidate, Salvador Nasralla, has continued to denounce in Washington what he says was fraud in the presidential elections. Que quede claro. No vine a Washington a pedir... To be clear, I didn't come to Washington to receive orders, nor did I come here to ask for support for my electoral victory, a triumph that was legitimized by the people's will and their sovereign right, as the vast majority gave me their vote in the November 26 elections. Today the people are defending this on the streets of Honduras, but they are being violently repressed by the Honduran government, which has destroyed the rule of law in the country. In Honduras and anywhere else in the world, a government which takes this kind of action has only one name, dictatorship. The Honduran opposition has continued its protest against the official result. Across the country, opposition demonstrators defy the police as they denounce fraud in the electoral count. The opposition has been demanding a total recount of all the ballot boxes, but now they have shifted to demanding fresh elections as suggested by the Organization of American States. We are demonstrating because we know Salvador Nasralla won the election and the government covertly stole the election from us. We don't accept the official results because we won, Salvador won, the people won. We do not accept the results, so we are going to be here in the streets. The vice president of Honduras flatly rejected international calls for a rerun of the elections. This is an autonomous and sovereign country. This is a country that is not going to do what anybody from an international organization tells it to do. I'll say it again, the only other election this country will have, the next ones are on the last Sunday of November 2021. There's no other elections. Let's hear from our correspondent in Tegucigalpa, Heather Gies, on the reactions to the recent developments. Hello, Heather. What can you tell us about the decision on Honduras? Will they accept what President Hernandez is asking to actually accept him as a president? I think it's clear from the protests that have been in the streets uh, almost for the last three weeks since the election and again since the announcement on Sunday night of the results that people are not going to accept this result. A majority of Hondurans do not accept Fernandez as the president. Uh, and it's not just the opposition alliance led by Salvador Nazarella. Also supporters of the Liberal Party have taken to the streets because they also say that this election process uh, has been illegitimate and they also allege fraud. So we're talking about a majority of Hondurans who are not willing to accept this result of the elections and are continuing to take to the streets. Just in the hours after the announcement on Sunday night, uh, people were protesting in dozens of locations here in the capital city, Tegucigalpa, also in the economic capital, San Pedro Sula, and other parts of the country. And those protests continued throughout Monday. They picked up again Monday night. And some locations, those protests are still being maintained today. So uh, I think the, the people are making clear that they are, they are not willing uh, to accept this result. And certainly it's clear that the announcement of Fernandez as president uh, does not resolve the crisis that Honduras has slipped into in these last weeks. So what can the opposition and Nasrallah do 
um, can they attend any other international organizations with their demands? So, uh, as you mentioned, the Organization of American States came out after the announcement of the results on Sunday to call for fresh elections. Uh, the chief of the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro, said that the, the election observation mission of the OIS still has serious doubts about the credibility of the results, and therefore, given that situation, uh, called for this election to completely be scrapped and new elections called. So uh, I think it's, it's hard to um, overstate uh, the weight of that statement coming from the Organization of American States. So that gives a huge boost. Uh, to uh, to the opposition's uh, concerns about this election. And I think that the Organization of American States will continue to uh, kind of carry a lot of weight as this process unfolds. Uh, it's a bit of a difficult situation. Um, the National Party has rejected that call for new elections and instead called for a national dialogue. And I think it's... Uh, worthwhile to point out that that call for a dialogue is, is the same kind of language that was used in the wake of the 2009 U.S.-backed coup against former President Manuel Zelaya. And through that dialogue, which eventually led to um, a failed agreement, uh, it sort of consolidated the coup because, because of the failure of that agreement done through an OAS-backed dialogue, Manuel Zelaya was never uh, returned to power before the uh, elections in November 2009, which opposition groups said just uh, uh, was a continuation of the coup government and helped to consolidate that coup. So I think um, some political forces in the opposition are going to be very wary of this call for dialogue because uh, it's, it's not the first time that they're, they're hearing that language. Thank you very much, Heather, for your report. That was Heather Gies from Tegucigalpa. And we'll be back very soon. Stay with us. been reacting to President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski's televised apology for not explaining his links to the Brazilian construction company Odebrecht. On Sunday night, Kuczynski told the nation that he had never favored the company or done anything illegal. But the opposition Popular Force Party, led by Keiko Fujimori, is pressing ahead with his plans to impeach him, and even his own party concedes he may have made some mistakes. I think yesterday he had a very extensive confession over these irregularities and what he did was confirm to the nation that he does not have the moral ability to continue to be in charge. There is no doubt over the president's honor. Perhaps he's not the best communicator in the world because there are things as simple as the lack of awareness of contracts which not only needs to be explained, but is indispensable precisely to avoid undue influence or a conflict of interests. He didn't explain that clearly. On the streets of Lima, some expressed sympathy for the president, but others dismissed all politicians as corrupt. I think they put his back against the wall, and now he needs to meet and collaborate with the justice system. Everyone here is corrupt. That's why the country, our country, has been brought so low. Because we don't have good governors. I don't know when this will be fixed. There is crime, and in my opinion, the president disappointed the country. Rescue workers and relatives in southern Chile say they have not lost hope of finding survivors from Saturday's mudslide. Five people are confirmed dead, and 15 others are missing after torrential rains triggered a landslide in the small town of Villa Santa Lucia, near the Patagonia coast. The town borders the Corcovado National Park, a tourist region of volcanoes and forests. As a result of the economic war in Venezuela, cash shortages are becoming an ever-increasing problem. However, community-based collectives are taking action. In a neighborhood in western Caracas, one such community has launched its very own currency. Our correspondent, Freddy Gillingham, has more. In Caracas' 23 de Enero neighborhood, residents stand in line at their very own community bank. In an attempt to boost the communal economy of the area, two local communes have joined forces to launch a currency to benefit everyone. 
So the panel is a tool for the less advantaged sectors, for the small and informal commerces, for social initiatives, and in this case, the community, so they can work in a fluid and normal way, in the context of a crisis and an international blockade, which is affecting our economy. The currency which goes by the local name of Panal is produced and provided by the community, marked with pictures of the commune leaders behind the initiative and, of course, the late Hugo Chavez, who held a special bond with this particular area of the capital. The next step is to create economic indicators so that people can open an account with Panal Bank so they can save money. As inflation levels soar in the country, speculation in food prices has become a pressing concern, made worse by a lack of the local currency, the Bolivar, in circulation. In response, the communes of 23 de Enero have organized themselves. Now their new panel notes can be exchanged for vital food products, which are also grown and produced by the community. Freddie Gillingham, Telesor, Caracas. Residents of Tijuana and San Diego gather at the U.S.-Mexico border fence on Saturday for a binational Christmas celebration, which challenged the hardline stance from Washington on the fate of undocumented migrants north of the border. People gather on both sides of the fence, separating Baja California and California states for the Posada Without Borders Mass. This is a Mexican celebration which commemorates the biblical story of Joseph and Mary. U.S. deportees were amongst those gathered at the Mass. President Donald Trump has pledged to extend the current U.S.-Mexico border wall and has also sought to streamline deportations of undocumented migrants. In my opinion, they are still uh, adjusting the machinery to deport more people. But uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, they, there might be more uh, deportees in the coming year. Dozens of Guatemalan families are currently living on the borderlands between Mexico and Guatemala after being driven out of their own lands. Months have gone by and they still have no offer of relocation from the government of Jimmy Morales. These people represent dozens of families that were evicted last June from the community known as Laguna Larga, located in Petén, the northernmost department of Guatemala. They had no choice but to settle in the borderland between Guatemala and Mexico. They tell us their living conditions are inhumane. Somos este 111 familias. We are 111 families, over 400 people, between children and adults. Our living condition hasn't changed from when we were first evicted. This is not a life we're living. This is not our land. Weeks ago, dozens of families took up residence in encampments outside the presidential house in Guatemala's capital in order to demand a swift answer from President Jimmy Morales' government that would allow them to return to Laguna Larga, where their homes, crops, and livestock were left behind. We are asking to return to our lands, but they haven't given us an answer either way. Nothing. We have been living under this condition for seven months, and the president hasn't made any efforts to even make us an offer to let us know whether or not we can return or if we will be relocated. The government evicted the inhabitants of Laguna Larga, claiming they had settled in a protected natural reserve. Regardless, residents have legal documents from 20 years ago that back their settlement in that land. Legal aides have said there are economic interests behind this forced removal. It has been said there is interest in coal mining, in oil drilling and resource extraction. And there are security issues to it to being close to the Mexican border. Social organizations that have joined the displaced families in their fight confirmed that, after investigating the circumstances of the events, they have found at least nine interested parties stemming from Canadian, English and French capital, all of them looking to exploit the natural resources in Laguna Larga. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Leaders in Catalonia held a heated final debate ahead of Thursday's regional elections. 
ERC was represented in the debate by Marta Rovira, Secretary General of the party. As its leader, Oriol Junqueras, remains in prison, facing charges of sedition and rebellion. Rovira clashed repeatedly with Ciudadanos presidential candidate Ines Arrimadas. People on the street do not notice the drop in investment, the drop in tourism. They notice the waiting lists. Um, I didn't interrupt you, Mrs. Rovira. You have a problem with reality. You live in the bubble of the independence process because in the republic you live in, because you live in a republic, and it's not surprising that in this republic you live in, we have seen how businesses have fled. We have experienced the economic cost. The Spanish state is allergic to democracy. It is so allergic towards practicing democracy as we are now or on October 1st that it completely alters the rules of the game. It does not respect the democratic rules of the game, and that is what prevents Oriol Junqueras from being here today. Oriol Junqueras remains in prison at the insistence of the People's Party, Ciudadanos, and the PSC. He cannot participate in this debate under the same circumstances as the other candidates in a way that is absolutely unjust and evidently harms the rights of voters. Saudi Arabia has intercepted a missile launched by Yemen's Houthi rebels, targeting the royal palace in Riyadh. According to the state Saudi TV station Al Arabia, this is the second such attack in the last two months. Via Twitter, a Houthi rebel spokesperson claimed that the fire, they fired the Basilic missile targeting the prestigious Yamana Palace Hotel in the Saudi capital. I heard a huge sound of explosion, but there were two consecutive explosions. The first one was a huge and the second one was quieter. I came directly to the rooftop like other people were. We saw very light smoke. As soon as I arrived on the rooftop, the smoke wasn't as clear. In the Gaza Strip, a funeral has been held for Ibrahim Abu Thoraya, a protester killed by Israeli forces during demonstrations against the U.S. decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Our correspondent Nur Harassin has more in this report. Thousands of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip on Sunday attended the funeral of a disabled Palestinian activist who was killed by Israeli forces over the weekend during protests against the U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. He challenged his disability. He had no legs. However, he participated in the protest to defend Jerusalem. Like all youths, he got angry when he heard on TV that Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine, not Israel. And he shouted out, we are going to Jerusalem martyrs in the millions. Ibrahim Abu Thuraya, 29, was shot in the head and died with a Palestinian flag in his hand on Friday. In 2008, he lost both of his legs in an attack during the Israeli aggression on Gaza. However, his disability did not stop him from participating in the demonstrations against Israel. A presidential degree issued after his death described him as a martyr of the Palestinian revolution. Abu Thuraya was one of the Palestinians killed in clashes with Israeli troops in Gaza and the West Bank last week. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, eight Palestinians were killed and about 540 were injured in clashes with the Israeli army in Gaza only since Washington's controversial announcement on Jerusalem. Nurharuz Intersu TV, Gaza. Now let's take a look at some of the news that's making headlines around the world. The United States vetoed a UN Security Council resolution rejecting the U.S. decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The remaining 14 members voted in favor of the notion. The UN General Assembly will hold an emergency meeting after the U.S. vetoed the resolution. After the veto, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, said it's an insult to the U.S. The United States will not be told by any country where we can put our embassy. Buried even deeper in the jargon of this resolution is the accusation that the United States is setting back the prospects of peace in the Middle East. That is a scandalous charge. Cyril Ramaphosa, an anti-apartheid activist turned tycoon and politician, has been chosen by the African Nation Congress as its leader for the next five years. Almost 5,000 delegates voted in an internal party election at a conference centered in Johannesburg. 
Ramaphosa won with 2,440 votes to 2,261 for his rival Lamini Zuma. It is almost certain that he will become president of South Africa after poll schedule in 2019. A U.S. passenger train has derailed, killing at least three people and injuring 100 others. The Amtrak derailed as it took a corner on a new stretch of track in Washington state at more than twice the speed limit. The train was on its inaugural run on a faster route from Seattle to Portland when 13 of its 14 cars jumped the tracks and tumbled onto a major highway. We're still not going to give any information about the deceased at this time other than confirming that there are some casualties. Our priority right now is really recovery, so that we just want to reiterate that. Top Korean pop star Kim Jong-hyun has been found dead in an apparent suicide in a hotel in Seoul. The 27-year-old star was the lead singer of one of South Korea's biggest pop groups, Shiny. The police found coal briquette, which releases carbon monoxide burning on a frying pan in his room. Kim left a suicide note for the fan saying, depression consumed him. Fans mourn his death. A year after a jihadist drove a truck into a Christmas market crowd in Berlin, killing 12 and wounding 70, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has met with the victims' families for the first time. The families have criticized Merkel for failing to personally offer condolences. They also accused the authorities over security failings and their clumsy handling of the aftermath of the assault. Flowers and other tributes were left at the site of the attack. For me, and I speak for the whole government, when I say we are working to improve the things that didn't go well, that we will do everything humanly possible to not only improve security, but also to offer people whose lives have been destroyed by this the possibility to return to normal life. And in the Greek suburb of Kipseli, an anti-consumerism market has reopened just in time for Christmas. We have more details in the next report. A few cardboard boxes, a couple of color markers, and plenty of imagination are enough to create a house, a dinosaur, or Christmas ornaments. We are here in Kipseli's market because we have set up a toy building workshop. We welcome all children, from the little ones to the older ones, so that they may build their own toys. The philosophy of the Christmas market is do it yourself. This way children begin to understand there is no need to buy things or spend a lot of money in order to celebrate Christmas. Here, they can even make the sweets they will share with their families. The children, along with their parents, decorate cookies with sugar and color them any way they want. The market also has room for social projects that take advantage of the season in order to finance projects that are developed throughout the year. We sell second-hand objects to finance professional help for people with mental illness. This initiative proves the best gift is not the most valuable one, but the one that passes on the most values. And we've come to the end of this daily news brief. This and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching. from Monday to Friday where you'll find the best information on innovation, conservation, human well-being,